All right, welcome back to the broadcast, friends. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio here on Republic Broadcasting. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and tonight is Thursday night. So, of course, as always, we will turn to the second half of the broadcast with our good friend James Evan Pilato of FoodWorldOrder.com for all the latest stories from the world of food, health, and the environment. So, James Evan Pilato, thank you once again for your time. Thanks so much, man. I, I appreciate it. And, I, of course, I always have a couple things to add on to, you know, the stories that you discuss in the in the first half. And talking about saving things, I always, yeah, I, I pretty much obsessively burn off, copy, and archive. I try and do, you know, everything I post to or link to, I try and just save the, you know, the web-only HTML file. And as long as you were talking about Firefox add-ons, my favorite one, as long as we're, we're talking it, Download Helper will let you essentially pull down almost any embedded video file, which for the kind of live show that I do, it's indispensable. So I'm able to get those videos and then pull the audio off of them and then edit them and, and, and use them in the show. So that's, that's one I'll, I'll throw out to people. Absolutely right. I, I use Download Helper myself. I do recommend it to people. There's a lot of other little things and tricks and tips I'm sure we could give people. Perhaps we should do a cyberspace war episode of uh, this uh, broadcast sometime where we actually go over some of our favorite little tips and tricks for people That's, out there. But, uh, I, but we I have like a lot on idea. our plate for the Food World Order tonight, so perhaps yeah. we should get into that. So perhaps an easy way to transition from the police state updates, we'll take it from Natural News. Feds hit family farms with labor laws for the children. New labor laws being proposed by the U.S. Department of Labor would prohibit children from performing many of the routine farm chores they have been involved with for centuries, which some see as a direct attack on small-scale agriculture. The DailyCaller.com reports that the Department of Labor, under the guidance of the Obama administration, is proposing that child labor laws be modified to prohibit children under the age of 16 from working with animals, for instance, or being allowed to work with food storage bins. The proposal also seeks to prohibit children from, quote, being employed in the storing, marketing, and transporting of farm product raw materials, end quote, which essentially makes it a crime for farm hands to touch produce once it's been picked. Working hand-in-hand with our good friends at Monsanto and the big pharma drug companies to create a total monopoly on food and health, the federal government is working feverishly to remove Americans from their own land and create a culture, complete ignorance about food, nutrition, and agriculture. The in-game goal is to separate Americans from their land, from their animals, and ultimately from each other. James, there are two good updates to this from natural news and from my own twitter feed at media monarchy obama withdraws farm child labor proposal after wave of internet outrage obama gives up fight to restrict child labor on non-family farms james well the key there is that more men in funny hats and shiny badges can pretend to presume to have the right to tell people what they can and can't do uh, on with their own children on their own farms that uh, that has been go- ongoing since basically the dawn of farming itself to have children involved in helping to uh, to pick the, uh, the vegetables and to to basically run the farm i mean it's it's a centuries centuries old tradition to say the very least so they can presume to say whatever they want to say about mm-hmm. uh, regulating things like that. But ultimately, once again, this shows when the people speak out, they can't they can't go ahead. So it's important for us to stand up and speak out. And I, I feel like we've said uh, several times that it it seems like it's all on the food front that people have actually made big changes. Because once, you know, BPA was, you know, the word was out about that, the outcry and, and you know, it, it changed the market. Same with high fructose corn syrup and all of those things. So, again, you know, never underestimate, you know, the going at it the right way. I, I think we probably referenced it yesterday in some way on New World Next Week. Throwing a rock through your neighborhood window isn't going to do anything. But letting people know about the information, telling them who's doing it, and giving them an avenue to be able to combat it, such as the the Bank of America, you know, debit card fees when people mobilized against that. They backtracked in a heartbeat. If you can hit them in their wallet, that's that's when they'll make the cuts. A quick Couldn't story. I said it better myself, and that's what we're doing. So, yeah, absolutely, let's press ahead. We uh, always talk about food stamps seemingly every week. Just a, a brief note, food stamps in the crosshairs of the GOP's plan to save the military. We, of course, will cut everything we can to just, you know, keep the war machine going, James, right? 
Oh, absolutely. Let's bend over backwards for the military and, and make sure everyone else pays the price. A really interesting one, and, and this will be the, the longest bit that I'll, that I'll read for you, James. It comes from The Atlantic. And, and again, a huge thanks to my man Adam in Nova Scotia for helping post so much great information to Food World Order. How Vegetable Oils Replaced Animal Fats in the American Diet. And you'll recognize some, some classic characters within this story. The byproducts of pork production meant that the burgeoning metropolis of Cincinnati was also home to many tanneries, bootmakers, and upholsters. Animal fats were hot commodities as they were rendered and molded into soap and candles. Breaking down pigs was a highly efficient process known as the disassembly line, an idea that would later be reverse-engineered by Henry Ford to produce automobiles. A major economic depression in the 1870s caused two important citizens of Porkopolis to join forces in order to cut costs and survive the bear market. They formed a company that would eventually be responsible for the greatest dietary shift in our country's history. William Proctor brought his candle-making business to the States after a fire destroyed his business in England. James Gamble fled Ireland during the Great Potato Famine and became a soap manufacturer. In a twist of fate, the two men happened to marry sisters in Cincinnati. Together, the brothers-in-law formed Procter & Gamble, a soap and candle manufacturing operation. So, at the time, soap was sold in huge wheels that were sliced into custom-sized portions at general stores. Procter & Gamble decided to take a chance by mass-producing individually wrapped bars of soap. To pull this off, the brother-in-laws needed to drastically reduce the price of their raw ingredients, which meant finding a replacement for expensive animal fats. Thanks to Procter & Gamble, the United States boosted the production of a waste product of cotton farming, cottonseed oil. To ensure a steady, cheap supply for soap production, the company formed a subsidiary in 1902 called Buckeye Cotton Oil Company. An issue of popular science from the era sums up the evolution of cottonseed nicely. Quote, what was garbage in 1860 was fertilizer in 1870, cattle feed in 1880, and table food and many things else in 1890. But it ended our food supply slowly. It wasn't until a new food processing invention of hydrogenation that cottonseed oil found its way into the kitchens of America's restaurants and homes. In closing, the company's scientists produced a new creamy, pearly white substance out of cottonseed oil. It looked a lot like the most popular cooking fat of the day, lard. Before long, Procter & Gamble sold this new substance, known today as hydrogenated vegetable oil, hydrogenated vegetable oil, to home cooks as a replacement for animal fats. Procter & Gamble filed a patent application for the new creation in 1910, describing it as a food product consisting of a vegetable oil, preferably cottonseed oil, partially hydrogenated, and hardened to a homogeneous white or yellowish semi-solid closely resembling lard. The special object of the invention is to provide a new food product for a shortening in cooking. In cooking, they came up with the name Crisco, which they thought conjured up crispness, freshness, and cleanliness. Now, James, we've talked about our buddies Procter and Gamble in the past, haven't we? Uh, we certainly have, and we've talked about, uh, was it Charles Gamble, was the recipient of uh, Margaret Sanger's Negro Project Letters, the infamous uh, correspondent there. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, and it's interesting uh, that they think that Crisco conjures up Christmas freshness and cleanliness. For me, it conjures <laughs> up uh, many other things, uh, mostly what I ate for breakfast. and Not that I <laughs> eat Crisco for breakfast, I mean, I'm making a vomit joke. But anyway, absolutely, just uh, quite a horrible horrific piece of history that, 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 again, goes to show that when we don't know the history of these various items that we use in our kitchen on a daily basis, we don't understand that, oh, wait, this isn't natural. This isn't the way it's always been done. This is something that was const consciously put into our society, manufactured into our society for the benefit of a few uh, businessmen. It, it really is when you, when you get into the, into the backgrounds. And that's, again, what I love having you know, the folks that help out on Media Monarchy are able to kind of take that extra time and, and be able to dig into the past and, and find those stories that, that hopefully shed light on the present. So we'll take it from civileats.com. Bioeconomy, blueprint or biotechnology boost. Last week, the White House released its National Bioeconomy Blueprint with a PDF link for you, which, quote, outlines steps that agencies will take to drive the bioeconomy, that is, economic activity powered by research and innovation in the biosciences, 
and details ongoing efforts across the federal government to realize this goal. Unfortunately, this new bioeconomy is not as green as the Obama administration's making it out to be. The so-called bioeconomy is dependent primarily on the risky, unregulated field of synthetic biology and the use of unsustainably produced biomass to feed synthetic organisms created by these technologies. The National Bioeconomy Blueprint, while offering little in new substantive policy, causes more harm than good by giving green light to the growth and profit of the synthetic biology industry without m making any real effort to protect people and the environment from the novel risks posed by this emerging technology. There is a ton of other PDFs for you to read, Synthetic Biology 101, that, again, James, I find so many things, you know, that that we do and that we cover is, you know, educational for myself. Indeed. Well, it's sad that my only comment on that is to say, well, what else is new? The scariest story, I think, on Food World Order this week, in a way, the most... As you said at the top of the show, the, the things that send a chill down your spine, and I post a lot of videos. There's a daily video from a site called BrassCheckTV.com. Dentist put terrified kids in straight jackets and performed unnecessary root canals. Texas toddlers being held in restraints as dentists at corporate-run clinics performed unnecessary root canals were among the dental horror stories told April 11th at a House Public Health Committee hearing at the state capitol. The Texas State Board of Dental Examiners, which regulates dental licensing in Texas, was the subject of criticism by members of Texans for Dental Reform and unaffiliated residents who called for legislative reform while levying accusations of ineptitude, a pattern of withholding or obscuring negative information about dentists, and failure to act against corporate-run dental clinics committing Medicaid fraud and harming patients. They have a video of this device and, and how to use it. It's called a papoose board. And it basically is it's strapping your kid down to a board. And it looks like something out of, what's the uh, Sean Penn film where he gets executed oh, at the end. Right, it's yeah. kind of that Jesus Dead Christ, walking. Dead yeah. Man Walking. It's that kind of Jesus Christ looking pose. Horrific. Absolutely horrific. So... <laughs> James, I think we've we've joked about this before that the way the stories come together, in a lot of ways, yeah, I, I plan and put stories in certain orders to to make them flow and to make make it all kind of make sense. But then other times, James, you know, you're in the middle of doing a show and you're like, how did this this all just kind of comes together? I didn't mean to put these two stories one after the other, but EPA official who compared enforcement to crucifixion resigns. A senior EPA official resigned last Sunday in an effort to end the furor over his remarks two years ago that the EPA should make examples of polluters the way Romans crucified people to quash rebellions. How you like that? Absolutely eerie how that does come together. <laughs> and uh, people will, will get a better sense of that when they actually go to the page and take a look at the pictures. But yeah, maybe I guess he shouldn't have called it crucifixion. Perhaps he should have called it, you know, safely, safe immobilization device or something. Yeah. 